you'd like a text this morning, you'll find it in Genesis chapter 22. One of the greatest victories in the Bible, yet one of the saddest moments. The Bible says, as it came to pass, after these things, God did tempt Abraham. And he said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into a land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham rose up early in the morning. He saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him. And Isaac, his son, and clave the wood for the burnt offering and rose up and went unto the place which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and he saw the place afar off. Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the land will go yonder and worship and come again to you. Brother Larry, you pray and ask God to help us, would you? Lord, thank you for church this morning. Thank you, Lord, for another privilege to be here. The health that we know to be here. We pray for those that aren't able. We thank you for your word. Thank you for the word in us. Lord, thank you for practical application, God. But when it comes across, Lord, that you get our attention and you hold it. I thank you for a preacher now, and I ask for him, Lord, that your power might rest upon him with this message for this hour. Might you use it in our lives. Might the word come and adhere to our hearts. We pray for a cleansing even before that. Lord, that we might hear clearly your word, that when it does come in and hear, God, we put it to use and make action with it. Might it change us as it does. Might it do a mighty work in us, which only it can, in determining our ways and our actions and reactions. We ask that you might be lifted up in everything that's said and done. Use your preacher in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. You can be seated. Just a few short years before this, God came to His friend Abraham and said at 99 years of age, you're going to have a boy. Sarah happened to be 90 years old. She's back behind the tent flap. And when she hears the Lord say that, the visitation, the angels are there, they're getting ready to go to Sodom, so on and so forth. I'm sure that you know the story. The Bible said, Sarah laughed. But before you're too hard on Sarah, might you consider this? She's well past childbearing years. And time goes on and the story is told how even though they heard what God said, they did no different than we do today. They decided they'd help God out. And it looks or appears that Abraham was still virile enough to be able to bear children because the problem looks like was with Sarah and so therefore they made a deal between themselves and he took his handmaid, Hagar, and they produced a child in and of themselves of their flesh. 
Oftentimes we do the same thing. God will make us a promise, but instead of seeing the spiritual side to it, we try to help God out in the physical realm. God didn't pay any attention to Ishmael. And one day, Sarah woke up maybe feeling morning sickness, a little nausea, maybe some bad lamb. She didn't know for sure, but she wasn't feeling too good. A little swimmy headed, don't really know what's going on. And all of a sudden she realizes she's getting a little older, but seems to be a little poochy in the front. <laughs> Abraham says, hey, baby, put on a pound or two. He said from the tent flap while she was in the back of the tent. <laughs> Using that girlish figure just a little bit, she said, baby, you need to come on in here. We need to have a little conversation. He goes, I don't need no come to Jesus meeting right now, baby. I understand. I shouldn't have said that. I'm really sorry. Which is a beneficial way to learn about marriage. That's a good thing to do. Man, if you learn to do that, get up in the morning. I'm sorry. <laughs> Call him at lunch. I'm sorry. Amen. Get home. Walk in the door. I'm sorry. Amen. Amen. You say, but for what? Whatever's coming. <laughs> she said, something supernatural is happening. I'm pregnant. That's a mouthful. I'm 90 years old and I'm pregnant. Wow. There's three nines there and there's a whole lot of things going on with that, but let me move on. And Abraham says, well, I'll be jumped. And the Lord said, you can be jumped or not, but I told you. Watch. And even though you took it upon yourself to, quote, help me out, my promises are still yea and amen. And I told you what was going to happen and you're going to have a supernatural birth. Well, Isaac is born. He's the apple of Abraham's eye. So much so that it gives the appearance that Abraham, who has always walked with God and talked with God and been with God to help and would do whatever the Lord wanted him to do, Something began to transition. Maybe it's old age. Maybe it's being too familiar. But all of a sudden, his eyes get a little bit more on Isaac than they do on God. And unbeknownst to him, he didn't know all the typology, didn't know what the Lord was going to do, didn't realize that Isaac is a type of Christ and the land he was sending him to was Moriah, which is probably Golgotha, probably where Calvary is and all those other kind of things that he didn't understand any of that stuff. He couldn't see off into the future and those kind of things. And so all of a sudden the Lord comes to him early one morning and says, hey, Abraham. And the Lord said, hey, morning, Lord. How are you doing? He said, uh, well, it's been a little while since we talked. Well, you know, Lord, I've been busy. You know, I'm not as young as I used to be and I've been busy and I'm trying to prepare and I'm trying to lay aside, you know, for my kids a college fund and I'm trying to make sure my kids got all the right training and we've been out at the archery range and we've been out at the slingshot range and, and we've been getting him ready to go to business school and, and we've been figuring that because if he's going to be the patriarch, there are certain things you got to do to prepare him. And, and the Lord, I think, may have said to Abraham, uh, can you hang on just a second? Let me ask you a question. What have you taught him about me? Because the real key to being a patriarch, Abraham, if he's going to be in charge and I'm going to provide for him a wife, which happens a couple of chapters later, if I'm going to do that, you need to teach him something about me. Not just prepare him for the world that is coming and the world in which you live, Abraham. I realize you're a smart guy. I understand that. I know you wouldn't be around here for 99 years if you didn't know something. But what have you taught him about me? Or have you taught him more that I'm about the provision instead of the one that provides it? If Isaac were to write a script about me today, Abraham, would he say, I know that God is God because of the lambs that we have and the sheep that we have and the goats that we have and the cattle that we have and the tents that we have and the, the fruitfulness that has been born and the way God's taken care of this and how you went over there and delivered Lot and so on and so forth. Would he think that it was all about the provision? Is that what you've taught him I am? Or have you taken him back historically and 
you trusted me by faith when your name was Abram before we had that talk a long time ago when you went to sleep and during the night time I walked with you between the sacrifices and I made a land grant to you. But in those days, Abraham used to be Abram. You walked by faith and not by sight. What does Isaac know about that God? Abraham's kind of, I think, probably knocked back on his haunches and gone, well, if I were to write a modern script, this is what I would say. Well, Lord, I, I mean, times have changed and things are different. And, you know, we got viruses and stuff now and, and there's colleges around that weren't around back in the day and there's events around now that weren't back around in those days and, and there's things that you can do and places you can go. I mean, we've become a modernized society now, Lord. And, and while I realize we had to depend on you for food and for water and for sustenance when it came to, the, to fruitfulness, when it came to raising animals and things like that, Lord, you know, we've kind of got that down pat now. I mean, again, it's been a while since I've even asked uh, you, uh, wow, it's been a while since I even asked you to bless the food that we're about to eat because I got to thinking, you know, I'm doing this on my own now. We read that first sentence so quickly that we never ponder or pause a minute to think that maybe the Lord said, take now for a reason. Because it looks as if Abraham had gotten maybe to the point where he'd been postponing what he needed to do for a long time and ignoring the Lord's nudging and luring the Lord's tender touch, the still small voice. Can I break off for just a moment and remind you that great preacher, that great prophet Elijah had that moment of weakness and wound up under the juniper tree and then goes into the cave and watches for the earthquake and the tornado and the loud uh, uh, fire that comes up. And the Lord comes and stands behind him while he's wrapped his face in a mantle because he was afraid of an invisible virus. That was a joke. <laughs> and the Lord came up behind him and said, I'm speaking to you in a still, small voice. Sometimes we get our ears so plugged with life, we can't hear the still, small voice. Amen. That's why I think he inserts the word now. Abraham, I've had enough of you postponing. I've had enough of your procrastination. I've been trying to talk to you like I used to talk to you, but since that boy's been born, I can't get a hold of you like I used to. Something's gotten in between that communication. See, this story is not about, as they just sang in the song, it's not about Isaac. Right. Isaac's not the problem. That's right. Abraham is the problem. Right. And it's a story about communication. It's not a story about sacrifice. It's a story about something has blocked God's ability to be able to get to one of His friends, the patriarch by which both Gentile and Jewish nations are going to come from. Pretty major deal. But the Lord is willing to hit the pause button and say, listen, if you can't hear me when I talk, then you're going to be left to your own devices. We're going to stop because if you can't hear me when I talk, you're not going to go where I need you to go. Because the blessed man is the man that walks not in the counsel of God or sitteth in the seat of the corner. But you know what he does? He uses the lamp and the light to be able to walk the way God would have him. Abraham, if you can't do that, we got to stop. Because where I'm taking you is not one of those things where you set your own GPS. I'm your GPS. But you're not listening to me anymore, Abraham. See, preacher doesn't say that. It's implied. 
Take now. Don't wait. Why? Because oftentimes what we do, and at the moment of salvation, this is why it's so important. Today, the Bible said, is the day of salvation. I'm not for postponing someone to get saved. I'm for, hey, you want to make the decision now. You say, why? You might die. The fellow asked me last week, or the first part of this week, he said, if you only had five minutes to tell somebody something before you passed away, what would you do? I said, I'd tell them about hell. I said, I'd tell them about hell and I'd tell them the Lord made it for the devil and his angels and that they don't have to go there. They have to trust Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. He said, but what would you tell them? I said, what could I tell them in five minutes that would make an eternity of difference? It's to tell them about hell and tell them they don't have to go there. Amen. Amen. Tell them it's a place where the Lord refers to it in Mark chapter number 4 where the worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched and tell them that if the rich man went there and he didn't have to go there because he didn't believe in hell or he wouldn't have gone there and tell them they didn't have to go there. Well, preacher, at a time like this, it's, yeah, yeah, but so what if I were able to come up with a vaccine right now to cure whatever's going on, it's not as important as where you're going when you die. Amen. Because whether or not you do or don't get it, you might die from something else. I just got the vaccine, walk out, got splattered by a bus. Listen, death is at the door. The wages of sin is death. No matter what we do, no matter whether you get inoculated or insulated from whatever it is that's going on now, death is still at the door. I just got inoculated. I just got, a, I just got the vaccine. Uh, the virus can't get me anymore. Okay, what about all the things that could get you prior to that time Amen. that weren't flu related, Amen. like bad guys Amen. and buses and trains and cars and planes? What about stupidity? A lot of people die stupid every year. I mean, if you ever, you ever done, you do a little bit of research every now and then, you're kind of like, re read up on this. Weird ways people die. They climb up on, a, you know, the back of a chair and it's wobbling and, you know, they know their shit and their wife's going, you need to get down from there. You need to get down from there. You're going to fall down, you know. And they fall off, bump their head, they're gone. Eating weird stuff. And they die. You can't inoculate from stupid. <laughs> they don't make a vaccine for that. So there's, a, can I just say, there's a lot of things that can kill you. And if God wants you to die dead, you ain't going to prevent it. Somebody said the Mexican cartels, he said, you know, if they put out a hit on you, you're going to die, especially if you're in Mexico. Okay, well, maybe they're that bad and all that stuff, and I'm not going down there to find out. Not that they'd be after me anyway. Uh, but there's a more certain thing that if God said your day's up, He knows He's omnipotent, but He's also omnipresent. He knows right where you are right now. He knows your attitude right now. He knows that Abraham attitude that has something more important than He is. And He looks down on each of us and He said, hmm. That apple didn't fall far from the tree. Y'all are a lot like your daddy. Abraham had that same problem. Just kind of started taking the Lord for granted. Do you remember that? That's what we're talking about. You know what I find is this thing right here that's going on, whatever it is, it certainly made me more aware of Death, dying, eternity, that kind of stuff on a daily basis. You know, because every day there's this stupid chart up there telling me how many people got it and how many died. And I looked at that the other day and I thought to myself, how many of them people died unsaved? But who's talking about that? Preachers nowadays, Christians nowadays are talking more about what's going on with the virus than they are the virus that came into the world because of sin, because of Satan. And as a result, our sin was is we rejected the way that he would have us to go. And so nobody wants to talk about that. But when all these people die of however they die, a lot of them go to hell. But who cares about that? But it is a heaven and hell issue. Yep. There's a whole chapter in the Bible. Have you ever read, when you read that passage in Luke 16, I hadn't forgot about Abraham. I'm not half-timers yet, but listen to me. You ever read that passage in Luke chapter 16 where he talks about the rich man died and then all that, and people say that's a parable? How come he never explains the parable? You know why? Because it ain't no parable. You know where the rich man is right now? In hell. He's been burning now for a couple thousand years. 
You say, well, well, what about Lazarus? Well, he would have been one of them taken out in Ephesians chapter number four because right now that place is empty. You say, well, he went to Abraham's bosom. Figure it any way you want to, but that'd be a whole lot better than you going to hell and burning. That's right. You can get all confused in all the words of, of Sheol and Hades and all that other kind of stuff. I remember one time a guy talking about, you know, hell is the grave. That's what the Jehovah's Witness are fancy for. And one guy said, and he put in, and I got this illustration from somebody else. He said, man, I wish I had known that. And he said, well, why do you wish you'd have known that? He said, I would have hung my sister on a tree. And he said, I beg your pardon? He goes, if I thought that hell was the grave, I wouldn't want my sister to go to hell. I would have hung her on a tree. Now that's kind of crude. Y'all Y'all even were kind of like, well, now, wait a minute. Yeah, but if you literally thought hell was the grave like they teach, yeah. you going to tell me Matthew's in hell right now? Of oh, the Apostle Paul? You going to tell me some of your loved ones that had a testimony and they uh, accepted Jesus Christ as their Savior? You going to tell me the Apostle Paul said, for me to die is great. I can't wait to get to hell. Come on. Come on. Hell ain't the grave. Right. You say, well, it's purgatory. There ain't even purgatory. Right. right. What's that thing that used to say, uh, you know, Oscar Mayer has a name, B-L-O-L-G-N-A? That's a good way to spell purgatory. <laughs> Tell them you want a purgatory sandwich with mustard on it. You say, what is that? It's baloney. That's something produced by somebody. You don't, you don't have to worry about that. You say, why? If you're saved today, Jesus Christ took your sin upon him and took it and dumped it off in hell and your sins burn and he crossed across the great gold fix and walks into paradise. Hey, boys, how y'all doing today? Good to see you. And there's Abraham. Wouldn't it be neat to have that place named after you, Abraham's bosom? Yeah. Amen. He walked into paradise. He goes over there and there's John the Baptist saying, Boy, behold the Lamb of God, take it away the sin of the world. And Abraham's over there going, Man, Amen. that's the guy. Yeah. Abraham had yet to meet him. Mm. Abraham had yet to see him. Wow. Amen. Mm -hmm. wow. He's down there waiting. Who are you? I'm Abraham. This place named after you? Well, the Lord named it. You ever met him? Nope. He gave me the name of this place. He knew me, but I had never seen him before. But I've seen some of the things he's done. Abraham, could you tell us about that? Are you going to tell us about when he allowed you to lead the charge with the king of Sodom and to get uh, Solom, uh, uh, Sodom to, to be able to go get Lot back out. Can you tell us about the day where the Lord had you split up and Lot went this way and you went this way? Tell us about the fire and brimstone that rained down and Lot took off with the two daughters and the incestual relationship. Uh, Abraham, you going to tell us about... You know what I think Abraham said? I think he'd say, pull up a chair. I'll tell you a great story. Well, Abraham, you're the father of all of our progenitors. I mean, you've gone before us and the Lord made a promise to you and you must have had a special relationship with you. Yeah, I did have a special relationship with him long about Genesis 13, 14, 15 there and he made a promise to me and I was willing to bring the sacrifice and I was willing to surrender all. I was willing to put all on the altar. I was willing to bring everything to him. I brought tuttle those. I brought he goats. I brought sheep. I brought lambs. I brought the whole bit. I laid it all out there on the altar and I kept the buzzards off of it and I fought about that and I went to sleep. I was exhausted and worn out and the Lord came through there as a burning flax and he walked through there and he made me a land grant. He made me a promise and he said some things after I had made the sacrifice and man, Abraham, what a great story. Well, I forgot about all of that. I got caught up in life and the Lord brought me a boy and his name was Isaac. His name was Isaac and there's a snicker in the crowd because they know the original Hebrew language. Isaac, son of my laughter. Isaac, laughter, a joke, funny. Yeah, how did he get that name? Because y'all were so happy? No, because when God promised it to us, we laughed. We mocked. We made fun. Like some of us do nowadays when the Lord's promised you eternal security. And promised you because you trusted Him, He'll keep you until the day that He takes you out, whether by death or rapture. And some of us laugh at the promises that God has made us because now we're not as comfortable as we used to be. Because the provider doesn't seem to be providing what He used to provide because it shows our faith is more in the provision than it is in the provider. Yeah. I don't know if you know this or not, but Christians are getting sick just like non-Christians. Did you know that? Did you know Christians are dying just like non-Christians are dying? Did you know that? 
Did you know that families are infected on both sides, the saved and the unsaved? And many Christians nowadays are decrying this idea that it's all about the sinners and it's all about the wicked people. It ain't just the wicked, ungodly people dying. Is it possible that the Lord is saying, you know, I want to ask you a question. Will you still love me if you don't get everything you want? Will you still love me if you get sick? Will you still love me if you can't go to work? Will you still love me if you have poverty? Will you still love me if you don't have all the luxuries that you've had in the past? Will you still love me if your kids go prodigal? Will you still love me if... And fill out the list. The Lord's like, oh yeah, Lord, we're going to love you. Easy to say when you got it. You say it as if you're going to continue to have it. You say, well, if so-and-so gets in, we're going to lose everything. How do, you even, how, how do you even say stupid stuff like that? Unless you're trusting something more than him. Can I say that I see in Abraham a lot of me? He's gotten so far along that he's begun to think he's did it on his own. He forgot where his bread's buttered, the way my daddy'd say it. You forget where your bread's buttered, boy? He called me boy. I'm 50 years old, he called me boy. Or 45, he's been dead 25, 26 years now. Here's the story that's found in the first verse, take now. As if tomorrow may be too late. The contemplation, the hesitation, the I will, but later. I'm going to, but later. What would be wrong with a surrender now? And let him work out the details. Because what happens oftentimes is, is we don't want to get too emotional. We don't want to get too crazy. Lord, I'm surrendering now. You do what you want to do. I'm going to surrender now. Work out the details later. But I know if I wait, I'm probably not going to surrender. Because if you hesitate, that means you're contemplating. And usually the end of the contemplation is, is, what you wanted to do in the first place. Yep. I didn't really want to surrender. Yep. Well, let me hurry the story along. This is the true Christian life. The Apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter number 3, he said that I may know him, the fellowship of his sovereign, and the power of his resurrection. Well, wait a minute, Paul. Can we get the context of that? Oh, oh yeah, I forgot to tell you. I was of the tribe of Benjamin, the Pharisee of Pharisees. I was trained at the feet of Gamil. I had all this. I had all that. I was everything. I mean, I was the chief of the police. I was everything that you could possibly be. I had so much power. I could put people in jail. I could have people killed and those kind of things. And, and I was revered in my crowd as the big man on campus. Well, Paul, what did you do with all that reputation and, and all that? I mean, the connections you had, the, the interconnections you had with everybody, the, the marketing, the networking of, of all the things and all the people that you spent your whole life doing. Paul said, I counted it, but dung. You don't need an up-to-date translation of that, do you? Paul said, I counted it as excrement. I counted it as waste product. I counted it as something that adds nothing but a, a stench to the room. Paul, all those good things? Yeah, that I might win the excellency of Christ Jesus. Why? Because those things were things that I started relying on more than I was relying on Him. Moody, I believe it was, is the one that said, we've yet to see a man or a woman wholly given over to the Lord and what that person could do because we all tend to hold something back for ourselves. I heard the old preacher say one time when he was preaching a message, he, he paused. He, you know how he would draw and he'd be drawn like this? And you can tell when a thought floats across his mind. And he stopped and he turned around with that chalk and he pointed at old bony finger. And he said, you know something that amazes me? He's talking to Christians. And he's pointing that finger. He said, you know something that amazes me? 
He said, some of you wouldn't go to the mission field right now without a U-Haul trailer. He said, if God had called you when you first got saved, you'd have lit out right then. But now you got a wife and you got kids and you got all this. And he said, you remind me of the guy over there in Luke, you know, got land, got oxen, got a wife. And he said, but you'll sign up for pennies on a dollar to go die for your country on a foreign field and go do a tour over there. But you wouldn't think about leaving your wife and kids behind to go to the foreign field for Jesus Christ, would you? Man, that must have been a thousand people sitting at that place. You could have heard a pin drop. Yeah. And he said, no, I guess the Lord's asking you too much to surrender all. And then he went on along those lines. And I thought to myself, well, that's pretty much true. You know, you get saved and it's kind of like I'll sell out now because I don't have anything to sell out. <laughs> and then the Lord comes to you after you got a little bit and he says, okay, good, let's go. Go risk your life for the government in a foreign field and won't leave to go serve Jesus Christ for a month in a foreign field unless you take her with you and the kids. I surrender all. What's worse, he said, is sometimes even if he wants to go, you won't let him, will you, ma'am? Wouldn't let your meal ticket go, would you, ma'am? Wouldn't be thought, wouldn't be prudent. And then he used some illustrations about Bible school. And he gave an illustration pretty close to my heart about how many people had wanted to come to Bible school and their parents tried to get them to go anywhere but there. But the illustration wasn't about a location. It was, I'm sold out. I want to go to Bible school. Well, anybody can do that. You need to go. Yeah, but what's God saying to do? See how difficult this is? This is more than Romans 12. This is more than just surrendering your body. It's surrendering your mind. Changing your mind, renewing your mind, not conform to the world, the world's way. Say, hey, I can figure it out myself. The Lord's like, okay, well, while you're doing that, how about follow me? Rich man comes to the Lord and said, Lord, I'll follow you. The Lord said, okay, go sell all you got and follow me. Has nothing to do with being poverty stricken or taking a vow of poverty. It has nothing to do with the Catholic Church. This has to do with the Lord saying, I know what is between me and you, and it is all the wealth that you have. He's, Lord, I've kept the commandments. I've done this. I've done this. I've done that. I mean, if anybody were looking at me, they'd say, Man, what a religious uh, uh, bulwark. What a religious idol. What an icon. I mean, look at man. He's done everything. Look at all the money he's made and all the stuff he's done. And the Lord said, You need to get rid of that stuff and follow me. Why? Because he he knew that was his Isaac. He knew that was the thing that stood between him and following the Lord. He wanted to follow the Lord, but he wanted to follow the Lord on his conditions. True surrender is something that Christians know very little about today. We surrender like he under... You know what the Bible says? And that man being sorrowful in his heart turned around and walked off. But the Bible is so up to date because he knows that in 2020, it's no different. Our monetary wealth, our comfort, our ability to control the players on the board instead of being surrendered. The Lord kind of lays the precedent down in John 13. After supper is over the time of, 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 of feeding yourself and taking care of yourself and ingratiating yourself and, and doing what you want to do, he rises up from supper, pronounces a benediction over it, and lays aside his robe. And what does he do? The creator of the universe, the king of the universe. By him all things are made. All things he speaks into existence can fling star clusters by just the sound of his voice. And he lays his garment aside, picks up a wash basin and a towel, and starts washing feet. Holy surrendered, even as the king who should have had his feet washed. And nonetheless, he's washing the feet of deniers and devils and people that would later do unspeakable things. And yet there he is, doing what the Father wanted him to do. You see that played out in Gethsemane. I know what I'm preaching is difficult. I know what I'm saying is almost unheard of nowadays. 
Because we come to church and say, what can the church do for me? It's no longer, what can I contribute? What can I do? How can I see more people come to church? And we had some people that made some contributions. You know what they said? If this entitles one person or can get one person to come to Jesus Christ, it's worth every dollar we can put in it. Yeah. Why are you building that big old thing over there? Maybe there are big enough people to go by and go, what is that? It's an ark. Get on, stupid. Get in, stupid. Amen. See, we, we get complacent, we get comfortable, and we even compromise. At times like this, it's kind of like, you know, oh, let's just put the shutters up and let's get, no, no, let's go out in the storm and bring the people in that are less fortunate than us. Let's go outside the gate and try to get the people in here to let them know, hey, look, there's something more important than losing your cotton-picking freedom. Amen. Amen. Losing your right. Documents more important than the Constitution called the Bible. But our attitude is we're going to hold on to our rights in Jesus' name. For me, ladies and gentlemen, as your pastor, I definitively say that's another Jesus. And that's another gospel. Abraham, morning, Lord. Sure is good to hear from you. <laughs> you know something, Abraham? I've been talking to you this whole time. That boy's been growing 30-something years now. Something happened, Abraham. You got a lot of earwax in there. You can't hear me anymore. Something. I don't know what's going on. What is it you think it is? Well, before you can answer, Abraham, I'll tell you what it is. Take now thy son, thine only son, to the land I'll tear them from and offer him there for a sacrifice, a burnt offering. He has a day to think about it. You think he slept the night before? I put myself in that picture. Try to understand how it must feel to try to develop some sort of a narrative. I mean, at times the Lord has kind of put me in the wine press. I don't know about you, but every now and then He's kind of put me in a position where I'm kind of feeling the squeeze. And I don't know about you, I don't sleep good. I don't know about you, I, I, I wake up in a sweat. I'm nervous. I wish I could say, oh, I'm, I got it. I'm just trusting the Lord. Sometimes He asks you to trust Him and walking by faith can be a scary thing. Amen. I think He tossed and turned all night. Sir. Sarah says, what's wrong with you, baby? We ain't got no little babies around no more. You can't be worried about the baby crying. You got all the lambs and sheep you could ever want. You got all the security. Man, look at these tents, man. This is the Taj Mahal around here. What are, you, what are you worried about? Oh, nothing, baby. Go back to sleep. Goes outside, the fires and the coals, and he throws a couple of sticks on there and blows on it a little bit, and a little flame pops up. He gazes at that flame. He knows it won't be wrong for that tent light right over there is going to be on, and his boy's going to be up. Going about his morning duties. And he's hung in time. And he dreads the rising of the sun. Yeah. Sure. He dreads the day that that sun's going to rise and he has to do it. Yeah. He's got to play the man. What's on trial is his faith. And Abraham is smart enough to see that but there is no record of him saying one word to his wife. That's right. You say, why? Whew. She just scratched his eyes out or hit him in the head with a frying pan. Mm -hmm. One thing mamas love is their boys. Girls, mama loves you, but not like daddy. Mama loves them boys. You mean my mama don't stop? The lamps get lit. He's standing there when that boy opens the tent flap. 
Morning, Dad. Morning, son. How are you this morning? It's a great morning, isn't it, Dad? Praise the Lord, man. I, I hadn't slept that good in I don't know how long. Boy, sure is a blessing. I'm going to go get ready to the sheep. I'm going to get the cattle out, so and so. I got to move them from this pasture to that pasture. We're running a little bear out there, and so on and so forth. And I got I to deworm some over here, and I got to get this, and it's about time to shear this and to shear that, and so on and so forth. Uh, son, can I talk to you for just a minute? Uh, well, Dad, I got a lot going on. I, I mean, I'd like to, you know, but I took a lot after you. I mean, I, I get busy sometimes, and I, well, son, could you just slow down a second and come here just a minute? Good, good time of the morning, you know, the sun just cracking over the horizon, a little bit of dew on the ground and, and a little bit of the cool here. Could you step over here by the fire for a minute? Well, Daddy, well, okay. So he goes over there. He said, uh, me and you need to take a road trip. Sir, we need to go on a trip. Where are we going? <laughs> can't tell you that. What do you mean you can't tell me? Well, it's going to be about a three-day journey. Three day journey. They got an Airbnb over there. What, what, what are we going to be doing? I mean, where are we going to stay? I mean, they got places along the way. They got rest stops along the area. They got. I mean, how are we going to get you know enough fuel and cannon fodder here for the for the camels and the and the donkeys and so on and so forth like that? He said, "Never mind worrying about that." He said, uh, uh, "I need you to go with me on a trip. Where are we going? We're going to go worship." Well, Dad, why we got to go way over there? Well, son's what the Lord said. Who? The one we worship, you know, the, the one that the, the Lord spoke to me. R really? Um, Dad, do I need to call the Alzheimer's unit or something you, that the Lord spoke to you? You know what? I went back and checked. Abraham had never said anything to Isaac, at least that I can find in the text where God had ever talked to him even before or after. I'm just saying maybe Isaac thought, that's a little weird. God talked to you? He said, yeah. He said, we're going to worship. He said, okay, well, what do we need? He goes, well, we need a knife for the sacrifice, and we need the wood, and you'll have to bring some of this fire right here with you and carry it with us. I'm going to get a couple of guys to go with us. Well, I'm going to say, you know, goodbye to mom. No, I don't say nothing to you, mama. If she asks you anything, just say, we're going on a sabbatical. We're going to go worship. Oh, okay, Dad. What's all this cloaked in mystery stuff, Dad? <laughs> Never mind, son. Sarah comes out. Hey, baby, how are you this morning? I'm doing good. You didn't sleep too good last night. No, didn't sleep too good. Got a lot going on. Well, I mean, Isaac's here. He probably got everything handled and stuff like that. I understand that. Well, come on in for breakfast. Now I ain't hungry. I don't feel like eating. I don't feel like I should enjoy any pleasure right now. What's the matter? Are you sick? You got the bug or something? What's wrong? You got the flu? You feeling bad? Come on in here, old man. You're getting old anyway. Let the kids take care of the work today. No, I got to go. Got to go. Yeah, I figured I'd take Isaac up down the road here and we go worship the Lord for a little while. You say what? We're going to go worship the Lord. Oh, oh, well. Praise the Lord, I'll get my stuff. No, baby, we're going three, ba three days journey. Going to give me 72 hours to think. He goes and gets two servants, they're nameless. Just like the two thieves are nameless. And they saddle up the donkey. And off they go. They ain't been gone an hour. It seemed like a day to Abraham. Every day he's getting closer and closer and closer. They come to the end of the first day and the two boys say, Sir, I think it would be a good time for us to pitch a tent here. We've gone far enough for the day. I think maybe Abraham's maybe kind of dragging his feet a little bit. <laughs> he's not in a big hurry to sacrifice his son. Would you be? Sometimes we dehumanize characters in the Bible. Would you be in a hurry? Okay, sounds good to me, guys. Pitch the tent. So they pitch the tent and stuff. Boy, they sit down there and, uh, boss man, you want something to eat here? No, I ain't hungry. You need to eat something to keep your strength up. No, I ain't hungry. 
boss, you, you fast, fasting or something? No, I just ain't hungry. Okay. Isaac's over there shoveling it in, man, like he's got a big shovel. And I mean, he's going to town. He's happy as he can be. He's got a couple of days off from the lambs and the sheeps and stuff like that. And he's sitting over there right across the fire from that old man. And he's eating so much, he looks like a puppy that got in puppy chow. And he's laying over there and he's bobbing and weaving and his head's starting to go and he's starting to get sleepy. And the next thing you know, <clears throat> he's out like a light. The glistening from those flames are catching just right all the features of that now young man that used to be a little boy, Isaac. And Abraham's sitting there staring at that face across there and his mind is remiss of every memory he could ever have of that boy from the time he got off the bottle to the time that he killed his first deer. Watching him as he learned how to handle the flocks and the sheep and to be able to learn certain things and the Lord nudges in Abraham and says, uh, something you forgot to tell him, Abraham? You're preparing him for everything worldly. Do you prepare him for when he's leaving the world? Lord, any way out of this? I'll slit my own throat, Lord. Cut my own, cut my own wrist. I'll be the sacrifice. The Lord said, mm -mm. I'm not interested in that. I want Isaac. See, Abraham would tend to think the problem was Isaac. It wasn't. It was his affection toward Isaac. Day one passes and the servants wake up the next morning. Abraham's already up. Just standing over by an oak tree. Just palm tree, palm tree. Just staring off into the abyss. Day one has come and gone. Day two was on the horizon. Repeated day one. Every step gets closer. You say what? In those steps is the Lord showing something. Abraham, you've been a long ways from me. It's time for you to come home. You remember the story of the prodigal? Remember that story? Do you remember what he said? He said there was a day when he arose and he came to himself. Right? Not somebody forced him. Not somebody pushed him. He made a decision. You know what he said? He said, in my father's house, even the servants have bread enough to eat. And I'm sitting here eating pig food. They won't even let me eat it. I will arise and go to my father's house and say, I have sinned against heaven and against thee. I am no more worthy to be called thy son. Could I just be a servant? Because I'd rather be a servant in your house. And you know what happened? He crawled over that barbed wire fence. And as he began to walk back toward the house all of a sudden, and guess what began to happen? He began to realize, you know what? I've been gone way too long and way too far. And the problem was not the father. The problem was is that distance had taken him, whether it was down the street or across the block or miles away, wherever that far country was. The problem wasn't that the father had already gone. The problem wasn't the father kicked him out. The problem was he left the father. Remember John and Edna riding in the cornfield in Alabama? They used to ride side by side in a pickup truck, go through the cornfields. One day Edna's over there looking at the same cornfields and she rolls the window down over there on the side of the truck and she looks out at them cornfields and she turns and looks over at John in the driver's seat. She says, you know, John, we just ain't as close as we used to be. And John looked over at Edna and he said, I ain't moved a bit. The Lord ain't moved. We just kind of slid over to the passenger side and we gotten comfortable being over there. You know what he said to you today? I ain't moved. Stay with me, I'm almost done. We're on day two. Abraham is beginning to realize I've been a long way off from the God I claim to serve, where all my blessings came from. I've been going through the motions. And if anybody were to write a history book on Abraham, they go, oh, look at what God did for him. But Abraham's kind of like, let me tell you about my boy. 
Day three comes. I call day three, time to go up the mountain. I think it's evening time. Three days journey. They arrive. They're at the foot of the mountain. The Lord said, that place will do just fine right up there. That's where I'm going to raise my son, Abraham. Sir, never mind. I'm going to put it on that very spot right there. Looks like a skull, doesn't it? Sir, just get your boy and get up there. Yes, sir. Well, what is it you wanted me to do when I get there? I said, offer your son. I haven't changed. Well, Lord, you know, surely after these three days, you got my attention. I've been obedient. I mean, I've done what you told me to do, and I got everything ready and that kind of a deal. Any way we can work a way out of this thing? Lord, if you do this for me, I'll do that for you. I promise. I don't know if you've ever been there before. Lord, get me out of this, and I will... So much human nature in this story. Well, okay, a couple more minutes. Isaac's pretty smart. They start going up. He tells the two guys down below, he says... Me and the lad, we're going to worship, and when we're done, we'll come back. You had to have faith, according to Hebrews, about the resurrection, right? That's pretty strong faith. You're going to kill your boy, and you're going to come back. He doesn't think there's going to be a substitution. He thinks because the Lord has promised him he'll be as the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea. He thinks in his mind, I'm going to kill him, the Lord's going to give him back to me. At least that's the hope he's holding on to. Kind of like we do at the hospital sometime. Thinking the Lord's going to work it out the way we want it to. Can't blame him. They're walking up the mountain. I think in the very steps where Jesus is going to go later. But that's another story. And they're going up there and Isaac looks at the old man and goes, look down, I'm not trying to say you're kind of losing it, but you are getting old. Because here's a knife and here's the wood and there's the fire. Uh, did we forget something, Dad? Where's the lamb? Now, we know that's the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. We know all that because you get the better revelation because you're looking through Paul's glasses backwards and you can see the picture. Abraham ain't seeing Calvary. Right, brother, brother. Abraham ain't seeing the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. Abraham is seeing his son with his throat slit, bleeding out on an altar and burning him. Right. He can't see Calvary. Right. What idiot would teach you that? He is consumed with, I am fixing to kill the light of my life. Don't blame him, do you? And uh, <laughs> Abraham prays a Nehemiah prayer. Lord help, how do I answer that one? The Lord will provide himself a lamb. Oh, oh okay, Dad. Gotcha. <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. Isaac doesn't have a clue. He gets up there, he builds the altar, he lays the wood in order and so on and so forth. He's got the fire so he can set it over here. He's got the knife ready and Isaac is like, something's missing. And at that moment, Abraham says to his boy, God told me, it's you. Now, I don't have the time to give you everything on that, but think about that. Because if the story is matching in type, the story of Jesus Christ, he didn't have to throw a rope around him and force him to lay up there on that wood. He would have crawled up there and said, Dad, if that's what you said God says, and he would have been a willing sacrifice. Tears are beginning to find their way down the cheeks of that old man. And that bottom lip is quivering just like a little newborn baby. And he is trying his best with his hands trembling and shaking to take that knife and 
do what God wants him to do and he's waiting for supernatural intervention and no intervention comes and he raises that knife and if I could draw the picture or paint the picture, I would show a downward thrust and I would show the Lord literally at the very last minute reaching in there and grabbing his hand and say, what you doing, man? <laughs> I would show Abraham fully committed to recognize and realize, Lord, you know what? We wouldn't be right here if I hadn't let him get between me and you. And I think at that moment he realized the problem wasn't Isaac, the problem was him. The Bible says the angel of the Lord stopped him. I'd show just a hand grabbing that blade right before it went across his throat. He succumbs to what I would call the great arm wrestling match. And he says, you know something about you? I know you fear me now. Wow. Isaac's probably laying there, Dad, can we, I can't take the drama, can we get this? Hang on a second, boy. And God says, we're good now. Look over in the bushes. And there's a ram over there. And his head's hung up in the thorns. What he's saying is, is that I've got a sacrifice over there and you ain't going to have to chase him down. I provided a scapegoat for you. A substitution for you. I think Abraham... Never was so happy in all his life to see a goat stuck in the bushes. And Isaac says, Daddy, you want me to go get him? And Abraham says, No, son, I'm going to go get him. I've never been so good. Daddy, you know you're getting old. I can hold him. He wrestles that old goat, holds him up, takes him over there. And if I could paint, I'd have him with a little bubble here saying, thank God for the substitution. Because at that moment, he recognized the cost of the substitution. Someone taking the place of his own son. Man, you talk about a worship service. That old goat bleeds out. That fire gets lit. Isaac said, Whew, man, that was close. <laughs> Daddy, what are we going to tell Mama? Uh, there's some things that might be kept between father and son. You might want to. Here's the story, and I'm done. They come down off that mountaintop. And the trip home was better than the trip there for one reason. Because Abraham and God had gotten back where they were supposed to be to begin with. And God had done all those things to give him a practical illustration of where they were spiritually. None of us would dare to think of anything like that with our own family. And yet God takes the time to pen that in the Bible to say sometimes the strangest things can get in the way when you start serving the provider more than the provider, a provision more than the provider. Amen. Including your own kids. Amen. And when they become more to you than me, the products of your own hands, don't get hung up on it just being family. Can I say, thou shalt have no other before. Okay, preacher, give us the bottom line. Well, thank God we're not going to hell if you're saved. Amen. Why? Because he was the lamb that was provided to take away the sin of the world. But after that, it becomes about our relationship with Him. Watch. 
You ever look the fifth cherub that covered? You got cherubim, you got seraphim. Seraphim have eyes all over them, all that other kind of stuff. You ever in there, holy, 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 and that kind of a thing? You ever look at, then you get the cherub, the fifth cherub that covers? Remember the devil? Do you ever recognize he was there for the purpose of singing and praises and worship to the Lord, Job 38, 7? When he fell, he wasn't replaced by one individual or one angel. No Gabriel, no Michael. He replaced him with a whole race of people. And he said, I'm creating you for my... For me. For you and me to have fellowship together. When was the last time you thought, how's my fellowship? Or would the Lord come up to you and say, well, let me ask you a question. If I were to take that Isaac off the table for you today, would you still worship me? Would you still praise me? Would you still honor me? Would I still have the same place in your heart if it cost you your job or your finances or your house or some material, monetary thing? We all face it. Nobody is immune to it. That's not to say that if you've lost something along the way, it's because that thing was between you and that's not... You, you're completely pulling it out of context. But you do need to understand this. In the last days in which we live, the tendency is, because we're lovers of self, is to think that the provision equals God being on our side. And it may be the very thing that drowns Christians in the United States if we start losing those things. And the Lord said, nah, your comforts and your conveniences are your Isaac. And if I take away your comforts and your conveniences and your ability to be able to move and shake and to be prosperous and have what you want when you want it without any strain and without any stress, and without, if I take that away from you, how many of you will stop coming to church and stop reading your Bible and stop praying and stop doing the things I want because I've taken away those things that are convenient? Will you still love me? If whoever doesn't win the election on either side? Will you still love me if you lose your constitutional rights? Or is that your Isaac? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. Joni's going to come play. I think I've said enough. I think I'd like for you, if you could, for just a moment to pause, just hesitate. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. To just hesitate, just pause, just for a moment. And instead of the Lord saying to you, Abraham, how about we reverse that? And how about you say to the Lord, Lord, is there something between me and you this morning? My pride? My anger, my wrath, my bitterness, my grief, my anguish, my job, my possessions, my health, my wealth, my family, my friends, my reputation. Lord, I don't want it there. My anger my bitterness become the altar at which I sacrifice. Constantly giving in to it. Would you take it to the mountain this morning? Would you lay it on the altar this morning? Would you be willing to slay it this morning and say, Lord, it's yours. I don't want it. It's definitely between me and thee. I, I want it out. I know it's not a message for everybody and I know in the day we live it is not popular. I understand that. Could you pray what the Lord prayed in the garden this morning? Not my will, but thine be done. Understand that meant him go to Calvary. Would you go this morning? Paul said, take up your cross and follow him. Paul said, I die daily. Things I want to do but does God want you to do them? Folks are still coming. If you're coming from the balcony, we'll wait. Preacher, the Lord spoke to me today. I got an Isaac. Good. Tell him, don't tell me. 
There's something between me and Him and we're not hooked up like we ought to be. Not like we used to be. It's easy for things to grow in the way.